Hello. Um, I'd like to start off by saying that um, the first two speakers were very eloquent, and I appreciated the words of the third. Um, I also think that um, Islamic and Christian societies have created amazing things throughout history, astronomy, political systems, blah, blah, <laughs> and so on and so forth. Um, obviously, you're more eloquent than I am. But um, I just wanted to ask, uh, even if evidence for truth may not be as important as um, sources of faith, um, how do you find truth outside of something that says itself is the truth? In other words, if your holy book states that it is the source of truth, are there any other ways of knowing that that is the truth besides the fact that it says it's the truth in itself? Okay, so that question is clearly under as you want. Yes, um, um, all three. All three? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Like the How about we do, we just go in the order that we see the chalk? Okay. Um, I mean, in Islam, we believe that all the holy books um, dictate to the so, to the belief in one God, and so so it's not just the Quran. You know, we believe the Quran was the final revelation, and in the Quran it says, uh, verily, in the creation of the heavens and the earth. And, um, and, the, and the changing of the days and the night is signs for those men of understanding, for those who contemplate, you know? Um, as uh, my brother Jake said here, design indicates a designer. So um, in Islam, we believe that, the, you know, the truth, that you have to search for the truth. It is in the Quran, but it's not like, once you only read the Quran, that's the only way you're gonna get it. It's all around you. And for those men of understanding. Okay. Thank you. Real? Uh, yep. So I think what we see behind that question um, is a kind of assumption that naturalism is, is where we start from. Um, we heard that from a recent science society today. Um, but I'd like to question that. Why do we start with naturalism? What, why is that the superior position? Um, as we've heard, um, most people seem to naturally believe in a God. Um, it's not clear at all that uh, naturalism is the null hypothesis. But in any case, the Christian position is that Christianity is an historical religion and that it's based on that reason and evidence both supports that. So uh, Christianity isn't uh, just a myth, isn't just a story that we've been told. It's, uh, it contains a number of claims that at least claim to be based on historical facts. And you can check out those facts. You can check the records that we've got stacked up with other records that we have from history. Um, you can also as Jack has said, and there's a couple of arguments he's given, he's given the moral argument and the cosmological argument. And we believe that um, for both of those uh, uh, items of evidence that point towards a God. So there's a combination of historical and moral and even some scientific evidence. And just finally to close off, um, we've heard that the reason science societies start with, uh, they start with reason and science. Um, it's not. Uh, the Christian position is that reason and science both make sense in light of the God who made an orderly world and made people who can understand the orderly world. It's not clear at all that on naturalism um, we have the right to expect to be able to do science, to expect to be able to, expect to, be able to trust the results that we get, um, and expect to even trust um, these advanced metaphysical hypotheses like naturalism. Um, yeah, it's not going to be at all that if we are the qualification of atoms, which I, I think is the consistent atheist position, that we can trust um, these things. We can just start from the position of faith and reason and science. Thank you, sir. And... <coughs> um, I guess, yeah, thanks for allowing everyone to answer just about. Um, I guess, as you all know, we don't have one single book. Uh, but we do have the entire scientific body of knowledge uh, constantly being updated and improved um, through research and new evidence. And I think that's all the outside evidence that we have. Okay, well.
we'll have one from this side. If you can come down to the little, please. Try and keep it even. Hi there. Um, this one's kind of in two parts. Um, for the science side, um, the question would be, I think, I'm bad on names, but the guy who made DNA was describing the random chance of the universe coming together in such a fashion, and that these statistical um, chances were just not really fathomable, sort of like as if I rolled the dice ten times and I got one every single time. Logic would um, conclude that something was wrong with the dice, and um, if we were playing betting, a betting game, I got my money back. <laughs> then the to the you know, Islamic society and the Christian society, I'd like to put across a question. Um, it's kind of a continuation from the previous one. It's that if the books, you know, the religious books, the Quran, the Torah, the Bible, they all presuppose a God, which, um, you know, that's a very plausible idea. I think it's when we get to the um, fundamental questions about this happened then, 6,000 years ago we had this occur, um, and this hair is fat, and this hair is law, and we can get confused about what's um, fundamental and what's not. I guess what I'm referring to um, here, which is on my phone, is <laughs> 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 um, things such as um, interracial marriages, that the um, Earth does not, is not the center of the universe, and that we revolve back around the sun, which revolves, um, you know, which is one solar system in terms of many, and the fact that as man being the center of, or the, you know, the one step below God in terms of the universe, that these sort of fundamental ideals were um, largely contradicted doctrine, and how we therefore, like how religious societies go about dealing with this conflicting information, evolution, etc. Sorry to be so long, but uh, <laughs> I think you can answer that. <laughs> <laughs> the process of random mutations in DNA is indeed random, as it suggests. The act of natural selection is anything but random. It acts as a filter through which well-adapted life forms will pass, and uh, poorly adapted life forms will not. So there is only a tiny element of random chance in the overall product. And um, also, it's suggesting that um, the chances being here are so incredibly low, I guess, as opposed to us not being here. Well, in order to assert that this it is an incredibly small chance. You need some sort of comparison point. And yet the only comparison, where the only um, reference frame we actually have is this universe where we can be certain that life has arisen. We have no other universes to compare this one with, which give an example where life doesn't arise. And so all we can conclude from this is that out of all the chances, out of all the possible outcomes, this was the one that we came to. It could be very well, it could have happened that um, Life could have arisen and it could have been infinitely superior to us. Perhaps it could have been up without sin, if you'll excuse the suggestion. Um, there's no reason to believe that there was um, any alternative to the way that we have turned out. Um, yeah, what was the question? It's <laughs> 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 no, um, great, I can just talk about anything I want to have to try and figure out the question in my head. Um, First of all, I'm gonna not answer, or because we're not doing the class, I'm not gonna talk about 
um, what Tim was saying, because I don't have an English accent, so I won't sound half as cool. But I think the important point, I mean, the, the, the assumption of the question that you asked is um, the Bible presupposes a God. Why do we believe it? Or how can we put faith in the Bible because of pre presupposition of God? That's kind of a faulty question. The question was uh, different. How do you reconcile uh, contradictions of the Bible no, with. with no. <laughs> <laughs> this is a good clarification. Like, it's more about how do you reconcile the difference between the two faiths? Yeah. yeah. So what was the question? <laughs> okay, I, I'm going to pass this off. Oh, what's the difference between Islam and Christianity? No. Or is it, is it, is it what's the difference between religion and science? Okay. No, no, no. Oh. First, first, <laughs> Uh, the science question has been answered. Now we're on to the second question, which was how do you reconcile the differences between the two faiths? Uh, no. <laughs> okay, we'll go back to the source. Science. And don't get me wrong, I am on the side of evolution. I do agree that it is 
It works perfectly. It makes sense. I mean, I agree that for some form of mutation do end up being very beneficial, although the large chance it is very, very um, deadly. But um, what it is is that Islam does not say there's an evolution. Rather, it says that there are stages of creation, which sort of entails that there's a form of evolution. So it comes down to more detailed belief of how evolution is or how it's interpreted. A lot of the time it's taxonomy and taxonomic <coughs> ranking that brings up some issues. So I'll leave it at that. Okay, thank you. And because the question is kind of involved, you will forgive the pun there, uh, real just have a five seconds. And even to that. Oh, yeah, RSA. Uh, RSA, sorry. Yeah. Um, well, I guess it might still be based on the, sort of the same question, how do you know, the religions reconcile with the um, new scientific evidence and so on and so on. Um, just as a side note, I'd like to put in that um, Islam was one of the uh, uh, one of the institutions that was responsible for saving uh, some of our most ancient philosophy, which is really cool anyway. Um, but rather than scientific evidence and emerging, uh, emerging scientific discoveries, uh, I think a really, really interesting question might actually be how religions reconcile, reconcile with moral progress. Um, you know, especially in the last couple hundred years, um, you look at huge steps we've made, slavery, suffragettes, um, GLBT, like I said, um, and yeah, um, I just think that would be an interesting question. <laughs> Uh, we have one from this side now. There's one on each one. All right. Um, my question is pretty quick, and it goes. I suppose just stand up. Um, it goes to all three teams, and it goes back to something I think the real guy mentioned in his speech. So my question is, what do you consider made the Holocaust or any other great crime in history wrong? Is it the violation of the rights and the dignity of the people who are the victims of it? Or is it the fact that it offended the law of some higher outside power? And you see, yeah, that's my question. Right, who'd like to start with that one? Okay, yes. Um, and obviously, we don't have uh, an agreed, um, we don't have a great doctrine and so as such. I'm speaking up more on behalf of me than on behalf of the RSS. Here you will find disagreement with that about morality. Um, but what I would say is, in the case of this, it violated a very fundamental right, and you mentioned dignity in there, but also just any chance of flourishing, any chance of happiness, any chance of what Aristotle would refer to as eudaimonia, so a flourishing, fulfilled life. Um, the core human decencies were really cut down and violated that level. And so it's more about, um, you know, there's obviously, I would say, rules that it violated, but the character that it demonstrated and the character that it was allowed for at a little more fundamental level is what made it so, so horrific. Okay, real. Do you have an answer for that? I think uh, there's a question underlying this, which is, um, what does it mean for something to be morally wrong? Uh, does it mean that it's obligatory not to do it? I think I think that's a pretty standard understanding of it. And if you're a naturalist, if I can, uh, this doesn't um, sound too terrible attacking the other team, but if you're a naturalist, I, I don't see how you can really believe that it's uh, morally obligatory not to have uh, not to have done something. Um, there's a guy called uh, Robert Adams who um, at Oxford who thinks that um, the divine com a divine command theory is the best explanation of uh, certain things being mor uh, morally obligatory or not. Um, there's a number of features of uh, what moral facts are that are best explained by a divine command theory. So I think if you set up firstly a false dichotomy, either it's um, some obscure rules of some god or it's human rights. That the Christian understanding is that we have human rights because God, because God created us. So what it means to live well as a human is to live in accordance with the purposes that God that is for. Uh, we have human rights and there are things that we ought not to do because God commanded, commands us not to do them. So I would identify moral <laughs> obligation with the commands of God. Um, if your naturalist is not at all clear uh, where these moral obligations come from, um, you, can, you can just start with rights if you want, but I don't see where you're pulling those from. Um, so you get this number of uh, features of moral obligation. Uh, uh, we believe that they're, um, they're objective, otherwise they're not, it's hard to see how they're actually um, obligatory. 
um, the role of guilt and forgiveness playing morality is insightful. Um, we believe that if someone does something wrong, then they ought, then there's the possibility of them uh, being publicly um, uh, implicated for that. Um, if one thinks something is wrong, one's normally motivated not to do it. Um, uh, and also, a wrongness itself plays a part in people coming to recognise that action as wrong. Um, so a few of these things, they, these, are, these are social concepts. So there's, there's two aspects. There's the social aspect of morality, and there's the objective aspect of morality. And when you put them together, um, they make sense, yes, and they're to mind very. Um, if you, if I didn't explain it very well, now I'll come talk to you later. Okay, okay. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so the Okay, um, I mean, the question was about, you know, obviously, um, doing wrong, you, you explained the Holocaust, and you said, is this morally wrong for human beings, or is it morally wrong about for a little higher than human beings? Um, well, for both. I mean, in Islam, uh, it's not like, you know, God says something to do, and it goes against your morals. Um, for example, you know, it tells you to kill people, and it's fine, and then you have people are morally like, no way, we don't want to kill people, you know? Um, I mean, even look at our prohibition, we prohibit obviously the drinking of alcohol, and um, you know, there are reasons behind it, you can see benefits behind it. Um, it says in the Quran, for example, that, well, it's the, one of the, the, the biggest sin is taking someone's life unjustly. There are rules for everything, uh, in, including war and fighting and stuff. So um, it says, you know, whosoever kills, a, kills someone unjustly is as if he's killed all of the people, and whoever saves their life is as if he saved all the people. So it goes hand in hand. Um, they both they both work together. No no moral laws from God contradict any moral laws from human beings because this is the way He created us to think that way. Thank you. Very much. Yeah, just say, yeah, on naturalism, naturalism does not provide an objective basis for morality. Okay. Moral relativism flows very naturally out of naturalism. So. I mean, so whatever I believe, the opposite is equally true of morality is relative. So, but if God has given you, if God has endowed you with intrinsic moral value. Sorry, can I just clarify that actually, um, moral naturalism is a form of moral realism. So it actually stands um, in contrast to moral skepticism. I think that may be a little bit stark. Well, the point is that there is no God. Morality so is not. Okay, I'll uh, object to actually breaking the rules. <laughs>
But of the of the four types, only one of them, which is the uh, the, the seed that took that was deep rooted, actually had the fruit of Christianity. And I think the point to take from that is um, there's a lot of people out there who know about Christianity and read the Bible, but it has no effect on their life because I, I don't even really, really even speculate why. But I think the, the I'm not speaking on the Bible, but it's, it says that there there is a distinction. Um, so you can find people that you know, hey, look at me, I'm Christian. And the Bible says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? So, and that's Jesus speaking to, to, to his contemporaries at the time within the church. So there's a really real distinction within the church and Jesus Christ makes this, this, this quite evident. There, is, there are Christians who are, who are following and running after Jesus Christ, and then there's people who are just occupying space in the church. Um, and as for gender equality, um, this is probably a difficult question for me to answer because I only occupy one gender. And I don't, I don't mean that as a joke, I just, I mean, that's, that's true, I mean, I can't, I can't say a huge amount about that. If somebody asks another question about that, I'll answer that in more depth. I think the Bible is quite clear when it's, you know, um, he created man and woman, uh, different functions perhaps, but there's most definitely an inequality. The Bible also says that um, uh, when Jesus was questioned by some, some, some experts in, you know, the legal Jewish law, he asked a question about, about marriage, and one thing that he did say to the uh, to what they call Pharisees in the Bible, uh, I think he said is he says that uh, in heaven there is no marriage, there's no male or female. Uh, so the, the point that Jesus is making is that there's most most definitely an equality of personhood uh, in, in heaven, and I think that's a, an important point to, to take take out of gender equality uh, throughout the Bible. Again, different roles and functions perhaps, but um, there's a you know, very I think I don't think I'm wrong to say there's a there's a there's a quality of Person, person. So, yeah, okay. I hope that answers your question. Yeah. Thank you, Sam. And are you wise? Um, and this, this, when the Sabbath came, that was in the 7th century. At that time, people were debating, you could say, in uh, some parts of the world, whether a woman is a human being or a woman. <laughs> At that time, um, Islam provided, gave women their full right. It actually identified the woman as an individual on her own. She has the um, she has the right to buy, sell without a guardian, which, which really didn't exist, or which those sort of rights weren't given um, in the Western world till the 19th century. And uh, she doesn't even carry out, uh, carry her husband's name, if you will. She carries her name and so on. Oh, well, I mean, um, it's a good question. We knew some of this would come. No, but um, so, uh, but. Um, Seriously, I mean, in the in the Quran, it's um, in, in Islam, it's it's quite um, to the, to the point. It's quite explicit about women's rights. Um, there, there's no, there's no you know there's no sexist kind of you know obey kind of things you know um, contrary to popular belief. Um, I mean, even it says um, it says in, in it has a whole chapter called you know for, for women. And it says which means men are means standing up for women in the sense that they should provide them with all women needs in the sense that if she's you know if she's your wife you provide her with all she needs you work in, so you can support her etc etc it is your responsibility um, because they're seen as you know precious in Islam and I mean as the brother here said I'm not I'm not exactly a professional in expressing the view but. At any time, just ask any one of the sisters um, here and just ask any one of them of their opinions. Obviously not now, but at any time. And um, they'll let you know. I don't know what, what else to add. I think it covered up pretty sweetly, but I would say that naturally, as human beings, and how we, we came to be, we were at a time, let's go back to say, the, the, the earlier years when men were on Earth, Generally, what would happen is a female is usually at home caring for the children, caring for the house, while the male is out there hunting. So it's a it's a harder job outside. What happened is that propagated through history. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Propagated down through history and it became embedded in culture that a woman usually stays at home and the male is outside. It's how it, it's just how a child picks it up. That's how we see it, and it just got passed down. Wherever 
what had happened is, during, with time, as religions came across, and I'm not too sure about Christianity, but for Islam, it came to, 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 to actually inform people that women and men are equal, and women can buy, as he said, can shop, can do whatever, whatever she wants, can, they said, she's independent, they're equal. <laughs> 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 right, um, Um, hi, um, Richard Dawkins says that humanity has been around here for 200,000 years. Now, obviously, Rio Campus doesn't like Richard Dawkins, but that's fine. <laughs> we'll take Francis Collins, who is a Christian scientist. So he says humanity has been here for 100,000 years. That's fine. I'll take 100,000. Now, are you going to tell me that for 98,000 years, humanity's life expectancy was 20 to 30 years old, and there was mass starvation, poverty everywhere, and then 2,000 years ago, um, God decided to intervene. Not, not in China where people could already read or write, no. Um, <laughs> 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 I have also one more question. Um, if my brother dies today and everyone sees him die, and then I see him tomorrow, that must mean it's very obvious what happened. I've made a mistake. He's not dead. So in the time where resurrections were commonplace, um, like Jesus Christ, and lots and lots of other people. Doesn't that just mean it's just a banality? So just everyone made a mistake? Thanks. I think that's a very good question. Um, it ties back to the problem of evil. Why? Why do people die? Why, why is there disease in the world? Um, why do people? Why do people not have full education? Why do people not live the kind of lives that we're privileged to live the world over? Um, I don't really have an answer to that question. Um, but the Christian answer ultimately is that Jesus, as you pointed out, did come. That God revealed Himself um, in in flesh. Um, we believe that the historical um, evidence that we have for that is good. We believe that Jesus is alive today, as you also point out, and that. This actually makes a difference, that that created the church, and that the rise of the church is, I think, something that we are looking at, and the rise of the disciples for less. And we may have heard of some books called the Gospels, so I, I think um, your uh, suggestion that people couldn't read and write at the time is slightly off, given that we do have the Gospels as accounts of Jesus' life. Um, but then you, yeah, sorry, I didn't really answer your first question entirely. It's, it's the form of evil. I don't, I don't have a good answer, but God's answer was Jesus. Um, the second bit, the resurrection. Our resurrections aren't common things, that's why they're called miracles. And miracles are, you know, they're not exactly everyday occurrences. Um, but these people uh, knew how to kill. Okay, so Jesus was crucified by the Romans. Um, they flogged him, and then they crucified him. And it's pretty likely that he was dead. So let's say he wasn't dead. Let's say he was buried in the tomb. Maybe he woke up later. It, it's, not, it's not very likely, but maybe if you're a naturalist, you know, if you're grasping at straws, that's the best thing to try. But with but, but his disciples, would his disciples see him? Would they worship him? Would they say that he had a resurrection body? Would they say that he was the first fruits from among the dead? Would they change their customs completely? Would they change their day of worship? Would they change how they lived their lives? Would they change the fruits that they ate? Would they change you know, their most core beliefs? And would they go and be martyred for those beliefs if they didn't actually believe that he had resurrected, that he had actually fulfilled the hope that they had in the coming Messiah? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I can talk a little bit more about that if you'd like. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's just one, one statement. It's a little bit of a straw man because um, Jesus, there were loads of religions there, and all of them had similar Messiah that resurrected. As you just said, well, yeah, that's, that, why that's simply coming. false. So, <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah.
guys like that. But yeah, sure, sure. Jake, well, you well, well, have well, one well, more. <laughs> so I'll let, I'm going to let Jake uh, have, because I, I think uh, he's, uh, sorry not Jake, uh, Zach, yeah, sorry. answer you, because I think he's still trying to. These guys will be available on the list too, if you'd like to catch up with them. Yeah, so we just said that it's not his opinion that uh, the Trinity is, logic, is logical. Uh, the logic is something that is regardless of people's opinions. So, so, so let's look at what, what the claim is. It's not clear to me that we've been a logical, but I haven't given a full blown demonstration of training, but it's not clear to me that we've been a logical inconsistency. What I've said is three persons and one God. I haven't said three persons and, sorry, I haven't said, I haven't said that three persons and one person. I've said three persons and one God. I've said that the nature of God is tri-personal. I'm sorry, sir. Um, it's all right. We're all at this now. Uh, just <laughs> 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 sorry. He's um, uh, going to make a good uh, question from this group as he's uh, one of the best. Yeah, so do, uh, do feel free to speak to these gentlemen and ladies. Quiz. I think I'm uh, to this side. Abraham, I'll let you choose. So we have to leave. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, folks, it's nearly time soon, so just be aware of it. Um, the Reason and Science Society stated that matter was created by an organic molecule. And um, don't you think it sounds a bit more logical to believe in a creator, God, than simply rocks and molecules? Um, I would like to ask who created those inorganic molecules and Okay, so I believe your question was um, how did the matter arise in the first place to be able to form such organic molecules? And, well, the honest answer to that is we don't know. And the first, the first law of thermodynamics is in fact that matter can neither be created nor destroyed. I think it's a common straw man argument of the Big Bang Theory that um, matter was, that everything was created at the Big Bang, which is simply not the case. Um, there is currently a time limit known as the Planck epoch, which is about 10 to the minus 43 seconds after the Big Bang, before which we cannot know anything regarding. And so to say that um, science has this theory on matter appearing from nothingness is simply false. Um, how we understand at the moment, it's merely at this point there was an infinitely hot and dense state of energy which expanded and cooled to the point at which we have matter. And then, as we said in our beginning speech, it accumulates into gas clouds and stars, planets, and eventually Earth, and then evolution led to us here. Um, there is no point anywhere in scientific doctrine that states matter came from absolutely nothing. Um, also, the other interesting thing to note is we're actually using very, very um, human current temporal terms when we talk about the Big Bang, because that's actually all we have is this, this um, idea of causation. When we talk about the Big Bang, from that, that was the creation of the universe. So it was the starting point of the universe came into existence. Um, and that includes obviously the spatial temporal framework we have. But if you have, um, talk about things that's prior to the Big Bang, well that's prior to time. So you can't really have the idea of prior to and causation, which is again temporal, without this. So it's quite sort of, it's very, very logically tricky for us to get our minds around that there is actually an inconsistency there. We're applying these very temporal frameworks to something that doesn't actually have a temporal framework itself in the morning? We don't know them okay, yet. We're working on that. Now we have an answer from anyways. Um, believing in the Big Bang doesn't necessarily believe in, um, this, it's not a reason to disbelieve in, um, reject the, the belief of God. In fact, uh, in the Quran, God said, um, touching on the topic of the creation of the universe, um, the heavens and the earth were one connected entity and then we separated them. And also in a different verse God says, um, He turned to the heavens and the earth when it was smoke and said unto, the, unto them, uh, said unto it, and unto the earth, come willingly, O Lord, they said we come obedient. So we believe that we, and the Quran doesn't really contradict the theory of the Big Bang, but doesn't, at the same time we shouldn't deny God, just based on uh, 
the deal of the Big Bang? Yeah, well, you basically summarize it from the Quranic perspective. For me, I come from, as well, the Quranic perspective, but also from science as well. Um, the reason why I was a believer in God is the aspect that I cannot grasp that something could have just come out of nowhere. Yes, essentially, matter did exist. It's not, not there. However, if you keep tracing back in time, you eventually ask where and how did it come to be. For me, the basic answer is to approve an divine intervention. It's also more reason that there's further more scientific reasons for me to believe in the, the divinity and God. And as for the aspect of matter coming into organic, inorganic matter coming into organic, that's not a complicated question. That is, it, scientifically, it can happen. Um, there was a paper previously in the 60s. They made us uh, some amino acids from inorganic matter. It's not difficult to grasp that these things can happen. It does not in any way indicate that God doesn't exist. It's God that allowed these things to be here. God invented, made these matter, and for them they just take for them they um, they just take courses that God allowed systems such as physics and uh, physiological and thermodynamic concepts that allows all these things to take place. And yeah. Um, just quickly, I'd like to emphasize on the point that he actually made. Um, a lot of people, you know, see this new scientific invention and they say, oh, there's more proof to disregard God. Oh, there's more proof to disregard God. Uh, no, I think it's quite the opposite. I think this is more science from God showing that he, is, he does exist and he does have these miracles. I mean, if these miracles, for example, as we believe, were explained in the Quran 1,400 years ago by a man who was known to be illiterate, then, you know, you know, he wasn't some super scientist person, you know, <laughs> for lack of better terms, you know. <laughs> um, so, so finding out all these new things about science doesn't mean we'll get further and further away from God, uh, only if you choose to, because I believe it actually brings you closer and closer to God. The more I find, we find discoveries, and we find already mentioned the Quran 1,400 years ago, I just say, you know, subhanAllah, you know, it's, it's amazing, you know, God is great on all things. Okay, thanks, Hassan, and we have... Um, yeah, just like touching the point there, they mentioned um, the Big Bang Theory is not necessarily a reason not to believe in God. I'd just like to say that um, in no way do I, do I um, use the Big Bang Theory <coughs> to, um, to uh, attribute it to my disbelief in the deity. Uh, my disbelief in the deity is based on the lack of evidence that there is one, as opposed to the advances in science. And as they mentioned, it is perfectly possible to institute a God into the uh, chemical reactions and physical equations which have resulted in the formation of the universe the way it is. But uh, personally, I view that as a violation of Occam's razor in that they're taking a perfectly well, um, ex and over determination, yes, um, in they're taking a perfectly well explained and substantiated uh, scientific um, explanation for why things have come to be, and then inserted an unnecessary and unexplained deity into the gaps, which is, in my opinion, totally unnecessary. Okay, um, thank you, teams. We've come to the end of our question time. I'm really sorry. I'm really sorry. Um, we're just going to ask the teams now to give you a quick uh, overview of their, of their groups. And uh, why don't we start with RSS? Is that all right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, everyone, for coming up today, by the way. Um, it's good to see people that I do know. Uh, just so you know a little bit about the RSS, um, we're not an atheist group. That's what I want to throw that out first. Um, in fact, um, five of the members here today are RSS members. Um, they could wait or you could just guess who they are. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you know, we're totally open to, to everything. And, and we have regular meetings on Mondays um, in OGGB, no, sorry, Case Room 4, um, from 5 until 6. And they're just on interesting topics. Um, more recently, we had uh, mass extinctions. Uh, but I mean, we've had other ones, including naturalism, which isn't like all that we do. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, lots of interesting topics. Um, look us up on Facebook, Reasonable Science Society, Brackets Orphan, um, and just see what's happening. Um, and just also, I'm uh, a philosophy student, and so morality is something that's very close to my heart. So I urge everybody, uh, if you're interested, go home today, step the Encyclopedia of Philosophy. Uh, look up supernaturalism, naturalism, and non-naturalism. Um, the third is uh, my question today. Um, yeah, and the original argument. Uh, yep, hey, 
Nate, I'm from Real. Um, we're also put, like, cross examining is like a sponsor of this event. That's that's us. Um, the benefits and everything. Get your name in there. Um, we have events kind of like this uh, all throughout the rest of the year. Uh, check out our website. Um, anything that we're going to do, we're going to have on there. We have a post debate question session next Tuesday. It's C303 in Arts 2. So if you have any further questions, if you get to King, uh, show up and we'll try and answer them in a bit more depth than we could here. And we'll really into that. Um, and RSS is a great club. Chance for checking out. Seriously, it's a lot of fun. Uh, that's all I can say. Thank you. Thanks a lot for coming, guys. Um, once again, I can't express our gratitude on behalf of AOIS for being part of this event. Real has organized it quite well, and they have put a lot of work into it. And I thank them very much for it. Um, us, AOIS, Open University Islamic Society, we're not just for Muslims. We're not Muslims as well. We hold events during the year, several kinds, yeah. lectures, um, recreational events, free barbecues, you know, and my clothes. I'm first in line for um, Yeah, and I mean, I mean, in the end, you know, we are just students, we're not scholars or anything, so um, if you're interested about anything to do with the club or Islam in general, just give us an email, sign up, send us text or something, you know my number. Um, and, uh, yeah, and we'll yeah, um, the website is info at auih.co.nz if you want to email anything. Please don't spam. <laughs> Okay, I'd like uh, to thank all three of the teams for being here this evening and for uh, gravely presenting their views in front of all of you. Uh, I'd like to hope you'll uh, join with me now in just applauding them one more time to say thank you. And I do want to thank you, the audience. You've been a marvellous audience tonight. Fantastic questions. Very well behaved. Thank you very much. Have a good night.